everyone. My name is Gabe Fahuri. I'm the president of Potter and Potter Auctions in Chicago. And behind me, down these stairs, is the entryway to Ken Klosterman's Salon de Magie, considered by many magicians, many collectors, to be one of the finest and most historically significant collections of Magicana in America, if not the world. So follow me down these stairs to witness something that um, I think you won't forget. Come this way. We're about to go 83 feet, six inches underground, so hold on. which leads us to a set of French doors set in stone here in August 1903. And the first one opens to my right, then to the left, and one final push takes us inside this private museum. Welcome to the Victorian room, as Ken called it, of the Salon de Magie. And flanking me on either side, we've got uh, relics from the careers of some of the great magicians of the golden age of the art form. We have uh, items from the career of Carl Germain, the great creative and artistic magician from Cleveland, Ohio, including his beautiful handmade carved table that allowed him to grow real roses from nothing. And on my left, we have relics from the career of Adelaide Herman and Alexander Herman, including a unique example of this poster in which she performs the Dakota cocoon illusion. And then on the far right of me against this wall, an entire display of original Houdini memorabilia, including items used in his final touring show, like this card star and the flight of time constructed by Schlosser used uh, by his brother Hardeen. We have a beautiful lithograph of Houdini upside down in the water torture cell printed by Dangerfield in London in 1912. And then signed photographs, letters, and other memorabilia from Houdini's illustrious career. What's behind the cocoon poster of Adelaide Herman? Uh, let's take a look. It's a file room and a card collection. Follow me. A big archive of memorabilia related to magicians of the last 250 years, all filed by first and last name, all inventoried and cataloged in a fully searchable text database, along with scrapbooks, memorabilia, magic props, periodicals, and related articles. And in addition, not to be outdone, of course, we have an exhaustive playing card collection from the John Snyder Jr. Company of Norwood, Ohio, right down the street from the original U.S. Playing Card Company factory on Vine Street. And, uh, let's see here, a whole bo uh, bunch of DeLand decks, including his card locator, uh, and steamboats even, including... Uh, some pneumatic playing cards and uh, other trick decks. Another focal point of the Salon de Magie collection is material related to psychics, ghosts, and mediums. So in this display, we have relics from the career of Houdini, including photos of him with Miss Benninghofer, the Chicago medium, souvenirs from Lilydale, the spiritualist camp built on the site of the original Fox sisters home, and even a rare Davenport Brothers lithograph at the rear of the chamber. The magician I'm gonna talk about now is Harry Keller from Erie, Pennsylvania, who occupied the top of the ladder in American magic from about 1896 to 1908 when he retired and sold his show. So the table that my hand is resting on is the gilt 
or gold leaf center table with all of the ornamentation that Keller used in his show at the center of his stage. So this automaton was made in the 1880s in Paris by Leopold Lambert uh, and his company that made animated window displays like this and a number of them because they were so mysterious and kind of proto-robots uh, had a magic theme. And so you'll notice the conjurer waves his wind once, twice, and then three times. And when he lifts the cup again, the die has vanished. What can I tell you about the theater at the Salon des Magies? Well, it's an intimate theater, as you can see from the four rows of chairs on either side of the floor of the theater. I think what's interesting about the chairs themselves is they came out of an old movie house or perhaps even a vaudeville house, and each one on the seat is chalked with the names of many of the prominent magicians of the last 25 or 30 years. All of them were close friends of Ken Klosterman, who established the salon as we know. But not only are their names chalked on the seats of each chair, uh, on each armrest we have the names of many famous magicians. The light and heavy chest of Robert Houdin is considered by some to be the most historically significant prop in all of magic. And it was used in the 1860s by Robert Houdin at the request of the French government to help, at least in part, quell a rebellion in Algeria. In performance, Robert Houdin could apparently make a man as weak as a child by apparently robbing him of his strength and making the chest immovable from where it sat at center stage. Our next step on this journey is through the mirror rescued from a speakeasy here in Cincinnati. And with a little twist of this brass dial, we will enter the Egyptian room of the Salon des Magies. So follow me. The magic props in this room in the Salon des Magies are organized both by genre and by maker. So starting up on my right, we have a display of props made by Petrie and Lewis. PNL, as many people knew them for about 50 years, manufacturing magic out of their factory in New Haven, Connecticut. Next to it, products from a Zauber Klingel of Vienna, Austria, a generational magic business made some of the finest apparatus known to man in the history, the modern history of magic making. We have beautiful pieces made out of wood and metal, bill tubes, dice vases, watch mortars, expanding playing cards, even a ventriloquist head with a control stick that almost looks like a typewriter keyboard. Carrying on, we have other specialties made with bottles, coffee vases, we have a Tarbell orange vase, we have brand vases, we have bottles that turn into flowers. In all, we have a thousand or maybe even 1,500 antiquarian pieces of magic apparatus built by the master magic makers of the 20th century. Uh, this is the Book of Mysteries of Dr. Stanley Jacks, the Swiss close-up magician and mind reader. And inside the book, you'll find what some people believe to be the first close-up pad ever put into professional use. And uh, Jacks would put that on top of the, the book when presenting his miracles at a swanky lounge or a nightclub or even in a shishi hotel in New York. But I think more interesting than perhaps even the close-up pad are the contents uh, of the, the book itself. And these include the props that Jax used to make those miracles. So we have his original Jax wallet. Some believe it might be one of the very first peak wallets, his dictionary trick with his crib here in English, his decks of cards, his haunted key. And then underneath, uh, a host of beautiful props for the tricks that he made famous. On this wall, these cabinets and their contents encompass over a century of magic history. We have a beautiful Robert Houdin mystery clock here under its original glass dome. And flanking that, on the right, we have props from the show of Alexander Herman, the magician that we think of when everyone sees a magician with a twisty mustache and a goatee, including some of the cards from his show in the bouquet at the very top of the display case. And a whole host of other props that you won't find in other collections because they were made one at a time to order by these incredible craftsmen. 
I'm going to demonstrate for you a magic trick made 130 to 140 years ago. It's uh, a boxwood vase made by a master craftsman and uh, it contains a little wooden egg and as they used to say in vaudeville it's a wooden egg because it was laid by a decoy. So we'll put the egg back in the vase where it began. We'll cover it up with the lid. And for you collectors out there, you might be admiring the construction of the vase. It's all turned by hand by a master craftsman. And uh, even so, despite its age, it still has a little magic left in it. It turns the egg into a little wooden cannonball. And that is magic from 130 years ago. That brings us to our next hidden room in the Salon de Magie. And uh, follow me over here as we open the door to the library. The library here in the Salon de Magie has become a resource and research center to bring into context and um, gather information about the other objects that have uh, become integral to the collection. There's a beautiful glass-fronted bookcase here on my right, your left, uh, filled with antiquarian volumes on magic, crooked gambling, and related subjects. So these are books from 1876 and earlier, some of the cornerstones of a really um, solid conjuring library. That, uh, that are contained in that case. Uh, unless, of course, you know where the door is. And in this case, follow me to freedom. Ken Klosterman's Salon de Magie represents not only 50 years of one person's quest to gather together historically significant artifacts, but also highlights of the careers of many of the greatest magicians of the last hundred years, and relics that tell the story of centuries of deception. <laughs> 